Peace be with you. I am Bruce Wozniak. This is Catholic Sports Radio, located at the intersection of your faith life and sports life, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and lots and lots of other platforms. My sincere thanks for joining me for this and hopefully many other episodes. I do truly appreciate everybody who listens and hope that you enjoy the show enough to want to tell others to listen in as well. As I'm sure you would agree, there are some really, really impactful stories being shared here on this show from some really passionate guests, and it's important that whoever the Lord intends to hear those testimonies is given that chance. So do let those you know who would benefit from the witness that guests are giving each week know about this show, and that's regardless of whether they are Catholic or not, or whether they are into sports or not. I encourage you and them to visit the show website, which is catholicsportsradio.net, where you will find lots to engage with, including logos to click on to follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also sign up there for the weekly email newsletter that I am about to start sending out each Monday morning. Now on to my ministry moment for this episode. Injuries, getting sent down to the minor leagues, toiling in the minors for a few years, The perseverance and dedication are all worth it when the opportunity to play regularly at the highest level is present. I think an argument could be made that probably more athletes than not are in it for exactly that, hoping to compete in their sport at its highest level. As guests on this very show have mentioned, you don't know how long that journey is going to be, and for some it's longer than it is for others and longer than they certainly would like it to be. They grow restless and walk around with anxiety, wondering if they're being noticed. Heck, we occasionally hear the story of someone who is a quote-unquote rookie at, say, 29 or 30 years old, and sometimes even higher than that. In this instant gratification society, we too don't want to wait. We are impatient, some might say on edge, and we all want everything now. We don't want to wait. Fast food drive through lanes, Amazon Prime that can give you same-day delivery, a fast pass at a theme park to get you right to the front of the line instead of waiting. But in our daily lives, and yes, for those athletes biding their time, waiting to get the call from the top-level team, we must remain still, knowing that the Lord is guiding us. In the Old Testament, Psalms chapter 40, verses 2 to 4 say, Sure, I wait for the Lord, who bends down to me and hears my cry, draws me up from the pit of destruction, out of the muddy clay, sets my feet upon rock, steadies my steps, and puts a new song in my mouth. Moving on now with this week's episode, my guest has had an extensive career in volleyball. The sport has seen her in roles from head volleyball coach at Shawnee Mission East, a high school in Prairie Village, Kansas, to being a volunteer coach at the college level with the Kansas Jayhawks, and even coaching a club team, plus having been a student athlete at the University of Texas, where she played for four years and was a member of the 2012 NCAA championship team. Prior to her time with the Longhorns, she played on the U.S. Girls Youth National Team that competed at the 2011 International Volleyball Federation Girls Youth World Championship. She led her high school to two Colorado 5A state championships and was a two-time Gatorade Player of the Year. Welcome to Catholic Sports Radio, Nicole Scotch. Thank you so much for having me, Bruce. Yes, absolutely. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you grew up in Colorado. Although one thing I know I have right is, wow, what a big Catholic family you grew up in. Yes, I grew up in Parker, Colorado, just southeast of Denver. Um, I am the second oldest of seven kids, so... um, there are four girls and three boys, and yes, my parents had their hands full and still do with two still in the house. So they're close to being empty nesters, but not quite there yet. <laughs> and Cradle Catholics, it sounds like for the, well, your maiden name is Dalton. So the Dalton household was Catholic all the way around, it sounds like, yes? Yes, we were. Um, grew up Cradle Cradle Catholic. Um, my parents did an amazing job of teaching us about the Catholic faith. And yes, my siblings and I very much appreciated um, their time and effort spent in that looking back, you know, going through it, you know, nightly, daily, 
rosaries maybe wasn't our favorite thing. Um, but yes, we grew up cradle Catholic and enjoyed um, growing up in a big family. And speaking of family, this is really impressive. Share with the audience about what has been happening every Sunday night for a little while now. Yeah, so Sunday night, my dad's family, all of them, most of them are in Colorado, um, but he has five siblings of his own, and my grandparents live across the street. Um, So they, I'm not sure whose idea it was, but every Sunday night started Lent, I don't know, five years back, I want to say, we would meet for Sunday night calls, and it's just conference calls, so whoever could make it can call in. We now do video Zoom calls so we can see everyone, which is awesome. And typically, um, sometimes we go over a book, sometimes we do um, videos from forum.org, uh, but currently we are having an individual lead each Sunday night. So um, it's great because it could be my grandparents leading it, or it could be, you know, my eight-year-old nephew um, bringing up a topic about our Catholic faith and wanting people to participate and um, prayer intentions. Sometimes we'll say the rosary. So it's a great way for us to gather and Um, praise Jesus in that way. How cool is that, audience? How cool is that, that her family does that? That moved me so much I had to ask her and let her share that because that might be something that you take away from this episode and start with your own family, especially I know a lot of people got video conference burnout because of the pandemic, but this is a family that has embraced it and is doing something through their faith through Zoom or Skype or whatever your video conferencing platform is. So I'm glad that Nicole was able to share that with us. Nicole, talk about when you started getting into sports and and maybe even volleyball specifically, as well as the competitive atmosphere in your household growing up. Yes. So uh, my sister and I, my older sister, she and I started playing volleyball probably in third grade. Wow. Um, And my younger brother, yeah, we played on a little rec team in Parker. My mom was the coach. It was my older sister and I and my brother. It was co-ed, which was awesome. And four or five of our other close friends in a rec league. We started probably in third grade, I would say. Um, And that's kind of how I started got, that's how I got into volleyball. And my cousins actually, they're a bit older than I am. They played college volleyball. My aunt and uncle played college volleyball. My parents played for fun. Um, as well. So volleyball was kind of always of interest to me from very, very early on. And um, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. And then yes, my siblings, very, very competitive family. We have backyard volleyball tournaments, front yard basketball tournaments. (laughs) Um, We set up the whiteboard, put our names in there, put our names in a hat, choose your team type thing. So very competitive Um, all the way around, which was super, super fun to grow up in. And there was enough, you know, six of us for a team. And then we had cousins down the street, so we'd get them. So six-on-six volleyball was awesome in the backyard during the summer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's one thing to be part of a team where it's, you know, for school or whoever it is. And, of course, you're going to try to play your best. But all of a sudden, it's family members now, and it kind of gets amped up. And there does become this extra competitive edge about everyone that you want bragging rights within the family, I'm sure. Yes. Oh, for sure. (laughs) There was, it was fun. Yes, but definitely very competitive and they have all, yeah, very fortunate, all of us. Um, So it ranges age wise from 28 to 12. My youngest brother is 12 years old. So all of them, my older sister played volleyball at Benedictine college here in Kansas. The brother after me is now playing professional basketball overseas in Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, I have another brother who's playing basketball at UCCS in Colorado Springs. Another sister playing at the University of Pittsburgh. She plays volleyball there. And then my youngest sister will be at KU, which will be awesome for us, um, for her to be close here this fall. And then, yes, Levi, he is 12 years old. So he's playing basketball and all the things, which Mm. is great. Well, you were blessed to be highly recruited coming out of high school. And as a result, your focus was on finding a good fit in terms of a college volleyball program you really wanted to be a part of yet your parents were more interested in a different program during these visits to college campuses. Talk about those contrasting targets that you were each after. Yes. So it was, my parents did an amazing job of helping me through the recruiting process. It can be a very um, emotional and time consuming process. 
And so they did an awesome job of staying level-headed, asking great questions when I didn't know what questions to ask on the visits. So it was probably the fall of my junior year of high school when I took about six or seven visits um, to different schools across the country. Mm. And, you know, my main priority was, you know, get a good education. And I want to play at a high-level volleyball program uh, where I can excel. And um, at that time, I wasn't thinking so much about my faith and my parents. Um, as I said, they asked great questions on the visits and they were interested in having focus fellowship at Catholic university students be on campus, um, where I would commit, um, not that it was make or break, but they knew it was a beautiful organization where I could, you know, be involved in, uh, commit to growing in my faith life during college in those formative years, um, So they would ask, you know, do you guys have focus on your college campus? And as I was visiting the University of Texas, they didn't have focus yet when I visited, but then they got it the next year after that. Uh Um, So that is also another beautiful story of how that came about. But yeah, they got the ball rolling. And um, looking back now, I'm very, very, very thankful for my parents in being so, that being such a priority for them on those visits to ask about focus and how I can continue my faith journey and be involved in Bible study and, um, yeah, continue to flourish in that. So I'm just trying to understand where you were at that time. Was it every time they would ask, you would roll your eyes and come on? (laughs) Or was it, no, Bruce, I wasn't bothered that much. I was just so focused solely on, I want it to be a good volleyball program that I'm joining. Yeah. You know, maybe in the back of my head, it got old sometimes. Um, so I don't, I don't think I ever visibly rolled my eyes, but for sure. Yeah. I think my main focus was, you know, uh, this is my main focus. This is why they want me to play volleyball. You know, that was kind of the shaping, that was my identity then. And uh, a few years down the road, I figured out, you know, that's not where my identity can lie. So yes. Yeah. And that's exactly why I asked that clarification because audience, I wanted you to understand where Nicole was at that point in her life that after you heard her talk about this very Catholic family that she'd been raised in at that point. And, you know, in the defense of a lot of student athletes who are that age, she said she was a junior in high school. Of course, you're being highly recruited. So all you're thinking about is, hey, if I'm going to go play college sports, I want it to be a really competitive and a really successful, in Nicole's case, volleyball program. But she also said her priority wasn't her faith. So I want to transition here because last October... On episode 140 of this show, my guest was Samantha Kelly, who played Division I soccer at the University of Connecticut. Nicole, there you were down in Texas, though. So how did you and her end up meeting, and how did that start to unfold? Yes, Sam, goodness, she's the best, and I'm so glad that she was on the show um, before me. But she, yes, yeah, so she was the start at Texas. Um, she was one of the first focus missionaries at the University of Texas. And my dad had some connections with focus in Colorado and she was happened to be in Colorado um, my senior year of high school. So we first met, she came over for dinner at our house and actually mm. stayed the night wow. at our house in Colorado. Um, and it was great meeting her. And uh, we laughed till this day because she stayed the night and the only bed that was open in the house was my sister's who was a freshman in college. So mm. she, and we shared a room. So that was Sam's bed for the night, which was, you know, I was fine with, but I was like, kind of like, who is this girl? How much am I going to get to know you really? And yeah, so that's kind of how we met. And she gave me a journal that night that I still have that she wrote Bible quotes, quotes throughout it. And we chuckle now looking back at it because we didn't even know each other. And she sat on my bed and gave me this beautiful journal And little did I know our relationship would flourish um, soon after that during my time at Texas. But wasn't that a little strange, though, because we did just finish isolating the fact that your focus was really volleyball. And here's this girl sleeping over your house who is there (laughs) on behalf of a Catholic ministry. And it seems to me that you probably were wondering, why is this happening? Why is this girl here? Yeah, I, I was. And, you know, my dad has welcomes anyone into our house I was like you know as I said how much am I going to get to know her you know I'll see her around maybe at mass but you know I didn't understand the extent to which she would be so inviting and open arms with me when I got to Texas 
And when you got to the University of Texas, were you even thinking about, I got to go to Mass every Sunday? Or was it, no, quite honestly, Bruce, I wasn't the, that wasn't even on my radar. You know, it was. Um, I think growing up as a cradle Catholic and my parents and grandparents just instilling those beautiful virtues of our Catholic faith, I still desired that. Yes, it wasn't forefront. Um, but yeah, it was more of a check the box type thing on Sundays, you know, to tell my mom and dad that I went or just for myself, you mm-hmm. know, like I want to be a good, wholesome person, but I didn't know um, exactly yeah, what that looked like at the time. So it was more of a check the box. I'm going to go to Sunday mass. You know, I might be up late partying on Saturday night, but I'm going to wake up still and go mm, regardless okay. of how, you know. Okay. So, yes. Um, and f- mm-hmm. folks, if you didn't hear two weeks ago my conversation with Father Chase Hilgenbrink, please go back and listen to that one because he talked about being a, mind you, he was a professional soccer player. He played in Major League Soccer. He played professional soccer down in South America and walked away from it all to join the priesthood. But he talked about being a student athlete, a soccer player at Clemson University and getting there and having to make that decision. Gee, I'm not with mom and dad anymore. Am I going to mass on Sunday? So go back and listen to episode 172 with Father Chase. Nicole actually underwent, yeesh, three hip surgeries And Samantha Kelly, who you heard us talking about, she stayed in the picture, as you will hear in Nicole detail for us. Each of the last two weeks on this show, I have stopped here to thank two recent guests who each made a financial contribution to my Catholic Sports Radio ministry. I can't tell you enough how much that means to me and how much that helps me. It absolutely helps me towards all the expenses that I face in running all things Catholic Sports Radio especially given that I don't get any income from doing this, nor do I have any sponsors, which means I otherwise have to try to find a way to cover these bills out of my own pocket, which honestly does get quite challenging. But it also helps me mentally and in my heart. When someone makes a donation to my ministry, it tells me that you believe in what I'm doing and see value in all that I put into this and that you want to see me keep this going. It tells me that there is a place for content like this. Other than emailing me or posting on social media or maybe writing a review on, say, Apple Podcasts, for example, I otherwise don't honestly know if the audience is embracing what I'm doing or not. So when I get a notification that someone has used the Donate to CSR button on the website or I'm contacted to get the info for sending a check through the mail, I'm left to trust in God that he's building an audience out there that does have a desire for the mix of faith and sports that I'm working to curate Some of my peers in the podcasting world share with me about what their shows are about and the support that they get from their audience. I'm trying to learn from them and I'm trying to learn from you so that I can feel good that I'm delivering something that you not only enjoy, but something that adds value to your faith life. If you feel I'm doing that, I would so greatly appreciate your considering my ministry for part of your tithing. On the show website, catholicsportsradio.net, there is a blue Donate to CSR button that guests and listeners alike have used to send me securely online whatever amount feels most comfortable. There's no drop-down menu of preset amounts to choose from. You put in whatever you want. Alternatively, as some folks have done, you can instead get in touch with me by sending an email to bruce at catholicsportsradio.net and I will personally write you back with the details on sending a check through the mail. Of course, I will happily say on the air the name of anyone who contributes, regardless of the amount, or as some have asked me to do, you can instead choose to remain anonymous. What you're hearing me do right now is something that I ask for each week on the show because there truly is a need. I don't just say it and move on. I am sincere in my appeal. Do please prayerfully consider what you can do as it relates to supporting my ministry through a financial contribution. I'm truly grateful to everyone who listens, and I appreciate whatever you can do to help me continue working to move more people closer to Christ through this ministry. Nicole, talk to me about mm, those three hip surgeries and about the continued development of your friendship with Samantha Kelly through those highs and lows. Yes. Yeah, so my freshman year, I came in and um, played that season. And towards the middle of the season, I had pain in, in my low back and left um, hip. 
and I was diagnosed with hip impingement and um, I had to have surgery in December of my freshman year. And then my sophomore year, I had to have surgery again in September and I redshirted that year. And then I flash forward, I had to have a second one on my left um, my after my junior year mm. of playing. So yes, it was, you know, those times brought uh, up a lot of emotions. Um, and yeah, it was no fun sitting on the sideline watching your team compete when um, I was out just recovering from those injuries. And that was the first time in my life that, you know, volleyball had really been kind of taken away from me, so to say. Mm. And so I had to deal with a lot of, um, yeah, just negative thoughts around that. And, you know, that's when the whole like identity thing, like, is this, this was taken away from me. And now I have this feeling, this hole in my heart that's always been there but it's now even more you know radiating that only Jesus could fill Mm. (laughs) and I didn't realize that until yeah later down the road probably my sophomore year and that's when Sam when I walked on campus Sam was investing in me and I will forever be grateful for her friendship and she had a bold yet very gentle approach um, in allowing me space you know to flourish in my faith journey And because she understood, you know, she lived the college life, athlete life. And um, but she was always very inviting, wanting me to lead Bible study. And we had Bible study going on for some volleyball girls, a few tennis and golf girls as well, which was really beautiful. But, um, yeah, we actually walked through. So I had surgery on my right hip my sophomore year, and she had the same surgery that year. Mm. Um, And so we walked together through um, our recovery, which was so, so beautiful. And I, that's exactly what I needed, um, was someone to walk side by side with me outside of the volleyball world. And that's what she did. And really, truly just listened and was there for me. Um, and yeah, that's how Jesus just flourished in my heart. And I started wanting to lead Bible study and learn more from her. Um, which was truly, truly amazing. Wow. Wow. It is truly amazing because, again, getting back to the first half of the conversation and you talking about that you're just so focused on volleyball, you're being so highly recruited, that's all you're looking at with the different schools that you're visiting, and here's your folks that are asking about, is there a focus program on campus? And you're going, yeah, I guess I'll probably go to church. You know, I might be out partying the night before, but, you know, it's just so I can check the box Mm -hmm. and tell my folks I went. But I think, though, that there's even more to your reversion story. Am I right? Yes, there is. So my sophomore year, you know, Sam, she walked with me through the lowest and highest parts of my time at Texas. And that is a big part of like my reversion story of allowing Jesus to be, yes, that number one priority in my life. Um, And that was through spending time in adoration and enter entering fully into the mass Mm. and knowing Jesus in the Eucharist. And um, it was after mass one day I was kneeling down and Sam was to the right of me and we had just received the Eucharist and I just had, yeah, I was kneeling down, my eyes were closed and I just had this, peace come over me and I was just crying and I couldn't stop. (laughs) Mm. Um, And Sam recognized that and she put her arm around me and she just told me, whispered quietly and was like, you are so, so loved. And, you know, to this day that makes me emotional because yeah, that's what we all long for is to be loved and Jesus loves us like that. Um, so that's kind of was a very pivotal point in um, my journey and friendship with Jesus. And um, yeah, I'll just forever be grateful for the Eucharist and um, yeah, Jesus revealing himself to us in such an intimate way through that. <sighs> Don't look for me to bail you out here because I'm getting emotional too. <laughs> Listening to you, <laughs> to you get emotional and to you tell that story, it's it's beautiful and and I can tell, I can feel it, I can feel the authenticity and and the impact that it had on you whenever that was, and and here it is, you telling the story now as though it just happened last week. So it was mm-hmm. uh, obviously a, a huge, huge transitional moment for you. Yes, I yeah, just beautiful changes in my heart and 
therefore it changed how I lived day to day and balance and keeping Jesus first rather than finding my worth in volleyball in this sport that, you know, is one day going to end. Mm. You know, I found it in Jesus, the one who created me perfectly and wanted to love me so intimately far beyond what I could imagine. Um, So yeah, finding true joy and choosing to trust him daily is, um, what kept me going and what keeps me going today. Yeah. In fact, uh, last week on the show, my guest was San Diego Padres pitcher, Craig Stammen. And one of the things that we talked about was his having a Bible verse on his Twitter bio. And Nicole, you do as well. Talk to us about Esther 414. Yes. It's one of my all time favorite Bible quotes. I love the book of Esther. If you have the chance to read it, I would highly, highly recommend reading that, um, especially as a female. But it is, Esther 414 is perhaps this is the moment for which you have been created. And that's just kind of what I've walked with through my journey, um, playing sports, you know, when you're nervous for a game and the anxiety is high, you know, when you're about to serve the first ball or, you know, when I now in my life when I'm a mom and it's like, you know, doing the mundane chores of the task around the house. Yeah, this is the moment for which you have been created. So always reminding myself that Mm. um, because this is exactly where Jesus wants you. And regardless of what suffering, what joy, what past, um, what future you have, it's, yeah, this is the moment for which you have been created. So I just love that and carry that with me. But I love that you cited something routine in the life of being a mom, because I think, folks, that's what I'm trying to show you through the mix of faith and sports. And Nicole has just done a wonderful job of doing the same thing of there are Bible passages, there are lessons that you take from sports, that you take from Scripture that do apply to your everyday life where you say, well, how does this fit now? And so you just heard a perfect example there. And I just mentioned Twitter, but there's something that Nicole, you do on Instagram that I want to give you an opportunity to talk about as well. Yes. So Prince and Praise, you know, Bruce, I'm not sure how long ago that was that I, you know, came up with the idea of Prince and Praise. I have the desire maybe one day to open up the Etsy shop. Um, And so I just love uh, calligraphy and lettering. And so I have a separate Instagram account called Prince and Praise. Um, for that. So I do commission pieces, um, anything from thank you cards to wedding signs. Um, yeah, so it's a really, really good outlet for me in the busyness of my life as a mom and wife. But yeah, it's it's been a great outlet and I really enjoy that. The first word that she's saying is Prince, like P-R-I-N-T-S, Prince and Praise. And again, the reason I wanted her to talk about it is because when you look at that Instagram account, you'll see These are overwhelmingly scripture passages that she is applying to different products, different applications. And so I thought it's a great example of how she is taking something from scripture and applying it to quote unquote everyday life. And then similarly, Nicole, you've got like something along the lines of a link tree and it has all kinds of links for things like skincare and beauty and clean products yet right in the middle of it all it says my favorite prayer litany of trust by sisters of life <laughs> so just like your twitter bio i love your putting your faith right out there like that and obviously that prayer means something to you to want to do that yes the litany of trust by the sisters of life is truly amazing um i went on a retreat to the Sisters of Life, and it was a beautiful retreat. But that is where I first was introduced to this beautiful prayer. And, you know, whenever, sometimes I do it daily, um, you know, not every day, but whenever I'm feeling um, anxiety or just not peace of heart, I love pulling out this prayer. And the two responses throughout the whole prayer are, deliver me, Jesus, and Jesus, I trust in you. So whenever you're feeling, you know, not worthy or your, you know, suffering in any area of your life, it's just really good to go back to. And every time each phrase, a specific phrase sticks out to me um, about kind of what's on my heart and what I've been praying with throughout the week. So it's a really beautiful prayer that doesn't take too long, but helps your trust Trust in the Lord. Yeah. And I know that at my monthly men's prayer group, we have spent time with the litany of trust also. So I will second the endorsement for the litany of trust Mm -hmm. you mentioned about being a mom 
I want to close by having you tell the audience all about your kids and your marriage, including how you and your husband met. Yeah, so I'll start with that of how we met. Um, we It was January 2nd of 2015, and we were both at the FOCUS conference. FOCUS puts on a conference called SEEK, and it was in Nashville, Tennessee in 2015. And I was giving my testimony to the male and female student athletes. So going into it, I was like, you know, maybe I'll meet someone here. Maybe I'll meet my future husband. Wow. <laughs> going into those Catholic retreats, you know, you're yes. like, maybe have a little feeling. So I felt that before going into it. And wow. he was not, he played um, sports growing up, but not in college. So he wasn't at that um, when I gave my testimony. But we met each other through some mutual friends who went on a mission trip together. He came in and introduced himself um, as Tom. His name is Thomas. A lot of his friends refer to him as Tom. But my first question was to him was, can I call you Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> and he went to KU, actually. So he was like, I would love to come watch when Texas is in town to play KU, which wasn't until six months later. Mm. Anyways, he is 6'6", six, six, I myself am 6'2", so we joke that we saw each other over everyone. But <laughs> we we kept running into each other randomly the next couple of days throughout the conference. He asked for my number the last um, day, and we continued to text and FaceTime, and we dated long distance for almost two years. And when I finished up my time at Texas, I moved to Lawrence, Kansas, where he had a year and a half left to school and moved in with one of his um, good girlfriends. And they had an open room in their house. I had no idea what I was doing for work. But yeah, that's how we met. We were like, we need to mm. figure this out. We need to figure out if we're going to be married and we need to live in the same town. Um, so that was really, really, truly awesome. And looking back at how focus has played a role in uh, my life, yeah. that was yeah, meeting my husband at a conference. No um, doubt. Very appropriate. Very really, appropriate. Yes. When did the two of you get married? Yeah, um, we got married December 28th of 2018. So just over three years now. And you have how many children? We have two kids. Gemma is our two-year-old daughter. And then Simon, he just turned seven months old. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. Well, Nicole, yeah, thank you. it's been so wonderful to have you on the show, and thank you for making time to do this. And we're really grateful that you came and shared your testimony with us on Catholic Sports Radio. Thank you for having me, Grace. This is an awesome show. Thank you. Thank you. And, folks, you heard how much of her life Nicole spent playing volleyball. So I want to close this week's episode with an athlete's prayer. Let's do it together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For I asked God for strength that I might achieve. Instead, I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked for help that I might do greater things. Instead, I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praises of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. Because I am among all athletes who have been most richly blessed. You see, I lost by inches, but I won by a mile. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. This is Catholic Sports Radio. Find more at catholicsportsradio.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It is at Cath Sports Radio on all those. C-A-T-H, at Cath Sports Radio. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's that it's Jesus that you always choose. Thank you.